Thank you for the introduction. So my name is Alan. Um, so I'm going to talk about post-operative abdominal and pelvic complications. Um, so while this is not a comprehensive talk covering all complications, uh, I will cover some of the more common ones. If I were to summarize the entire talk, I would say all, com all complications involve bleeding, infection, and organ injury. We'll talk about some other uh, surgery-specific complications. We'll start with colorectal surgery, although I would argue that a lot of these complications um, can be generalized to all resection in general. So here again, other complications, bleeding, infection, some other things include an asthmatic leak and small bowel obstruction. Here's our first case, post-proctocolectomy uh, presents with fever. We do notice throughout the abdomen there's these hyperdense fluid collections, uh, some of them with fluid fluid levels. We see that again on this coronal image. Um, so this is a hemoperitoneum, so bleeding. Um, also in the same patient, there's this presacral collection of gas and fluid. So this is a presacral abscess. You'll also notice that there's a lot of soft tissue thickening and stranding in the anterior abdominal wall. Um, there was purulent drainage on, on clinical exam, so this was also a surgical site infection. So this next patient, um, again, uh, post-colectomy, presents with nausea and vomiting. And we do see pneumoperitoneum and a lot of fluid along the right abdomen. And if you carefully look at the suture line, there's the focal discontinuity right here where it enters this fluid. So this is an anastomotic leak, uh, secondary to suture dehiscence. <clears throat> this next patient is, a, is an ulcerative colitis patient. And when we look at her, her pelvis and look at the J pouch, we do see that the, the J pouch is thickened and inflamed. There's a lot of uh, mucosal hyperenhancement and stranding around it. So this is a pouchitis. So pouchitis is a post-proctocolectomy complication in UC patients. Uh, the etiology is not fully understood, although it's thought to be related to disruption of the intestinal flora. Here are some of the CT findings, and we saw some of this in our case. Next, we'll move on to biliary complications. Uh, we'll talk about cholecystectomy, uh, which has an open and a laparoscopic approach. Uh, the open approach is typically has a lower complication rate because of uh, a, a better field of view, uh, although the laparoscopic approach is becoming preferred or is preferred. Um, here are some of the complications, and we'll go over some of these. So this first patient is post-cholecystectomy presenting with pain and fever. Um, and in the liver, we see these two lesions. So this first one looks like it's a walled-off, multilocular complex collection. Um, and then the second lesion, not really a wall, but there is this hyperdense tubular component. Um, so I don't think anyone will argue. We said that this first collection is an abscess. But what about the second one? Uh, sort of unclear, maybe just an unusual presentation of an abscess, although there is this hyperdense tubular component, like I mentioned, um, so thought to be vascular, maybe. So this goes on to a CT angiogram, and here are the images. So again, here's that hyperdense tubular structure. And we do see a tiny feeding vessel right here from the hepatic artery. So this is a hepatic artery pseudoaneurysm. Um, so the next patient, um, present, again, cholecystectomy, presents with abdominal pain. Um, we do see this large collection in the uh, subhepatic region extending down the right paracolic gutter. Um, in order to confirm whether this is a bile leak versus just some postoperative collection, this patient goes on to a HIDA scan. Here are the images. So as we go through, we see tracer start accumulating in the right upper quadrant right here. And upon further delay, the collection starts going down to the right paracolic gutter. So putting these images together, this is a bowel leak. Moving on to the next topic, uh, drop gallstones. Uh, these result as, uh, as in, uh, from injury to the gallbladder and spillage of its contents. Uh, it occurs more frequently in laparoscopic cases because of a smaller field of view. Uh, it's estimated to occur in up to 15 to 40 percent of cases, and in these cases, complete extraction of the, uh, the, the gallstones is only possible in one half to two thirds of cases. A sister topic, the drop clip. Uh, incidence of this is unclear. Uh, drop clips are typically thought to be inert, so they're underreported. Um, in one study that I found, comparing the two complications, they, found, they said that about half, just over half of the dropped stones developed into abscesses, whereas none of the dropped clips developed into abscesses. So here's our case. Uh, we immediately see the stone material along the posterior margin of the liver, and in an adjacent slice just above that, we do see this ill-defined fluid collection. So this is an abscess secondary to a dropped stone. Uh, different patient, again, we see a dropped stone. This patient is presenting with abdominal pain and fever. Uh, when we look up a little bit higher in the gallbladder fossa, we see this large collection of gas, fluid, and some frothy material. Um, so let's take a step back. We'll look at the operative note. Um, the surgeon does note that they made a tear in the gallbladder and spilled some material, so that kind of explains our dropped stone. 
reviewing further, they, they mentioned that they had some issues with bleeding, which they controlled with surgery cell material. So looking back at our image, this frothy appearance is a classic appearance for uh, surgery cell material. So I guess the question is, are we happy? Because the operative note seems to explain all the CT findings. Well, no, because one, there's this air fluid level here which remains suspicious, and two, the patient is symptomatic. So this goes on to IR drainage, where they're found to have uh, an infected postoperative hematoma. Next, we'll talk about the dropped clip, uh, migrated clip. Uh, so the pathophysiology is poorly understood, but it's thought to be related to involution of the cystic duct stump, pulling the clip into the lumen, and as that tissue undergoes further necrosis, it becomes free in the lumen. Uh, so complications mimic those of cholelithiasis. Uh, it can directly obstruct, or it may serve as a nidus for stone formation. That's what we're seeing here. So here's our patient with a remote history of cholecystectomy. Um, in this case, we see three clips in the gallbladder fossa and an additional clip in the common duct. Here's the same patient from four years prior where all four clips were seen in the gallbladder fossa at this time. No other clips were seen in this patient. So this is a, a, a migrated clip causing biliary colic. Next, we'll move on to bariatric cases. Uh, we'll focus mainly on gastric bypass. Uh, in these cases, knowledge of anatomy is very important. We should know the presence of the two anastomoses, uh, the gastrojejunal and the jejunojejunal, and we should be able to locate them on a rescan. Um, position of the room is also very important. Oral contrast may help in these cases for identifying these uh, findings. So a little bit about the, uh, the rulum. Um, can be anticholic or retrocholic. Here are some of the advantages and disadvantages. Uh, just to highlight, uh, the anticholic approach creates more tension on the GJA anastomosis, which is associated with an increased rate of leak and stomal stenosis. Uh, the retrocholic approach creates an additional mesenteric defect, specifically the mesocolic defect, and that has a risk of internal hernia. So here are some complications of gastric bypass. Uh, we'll look at some of these. Uh, so this first case is post-bypass one month ago. Uh, presents with abdominal pain, and we see here at the level of the jejunojejunal anastomosis, there's this hyperdense collection. So this is a hematoma. And this next patient um, also presenting with abdominal pain. Uh, so immediately you see that there's gas and oral contrast around the liver and some contrast around the spleen. And if we follow this inferiorly, we see that this gas continues with the gastric lumen. So this is a good case for an anastomotic leak. This next patient is a history of known bleeding marginal ulcers. Uh, it's also noted in his history that he was recently placed on aspirin because of a cardiac procedure. So looking at these images, if you look at the look along the superior margin of the stomach here, you see this parent focal discontinuity, uh, and you see a lot of stranding around this region. Uh, this patient was taken to the OR, where he's found to have a perforated marginal ulcer. So marginal ulcers are multifactorial in etiology. Uh, they typically respond well to medical therapy. Uh, they can be imaged with barium swallow, uh, where it may, you may see an ulceration at the gastrojejunal anastomosis. Uh, CT is, pref uh, is preferred in the ER, although uh, diagnosis is difficult because stranding may be your only finding. Um, oral contrast may help, but uh, there's also the risk of false positives. Um, endoscopy can be performed for definitive diagnosis, although um, as an R patient, the patient may be directly taken to the OR. Here's the next patient. Um, gastric bypass with diffuse abdominal pain. I'll, I'll highlight the rulum uh, right here. And if you follow the rulum, you'll notice that, it, sorry, the rulum here gets pulled into the right lower quadrant. Uh, coming back up, if you follow the ascending colon here, you'll see that it enters the swirl and gets this place at the midline right there. Um, so this is an internal hernia with a swirl sign uh, and displaced bowel loops. Uh, so internal hernia, the diagnosis is difficult to make. Here are some of the findings. You'll notice that some of them are kind of nonspecific. Uh, displaced bowel loops can be seen in uh, just a postoperative abdomen. Mesenteric twist, you sometimes see some edema, um, very nonspecific findings, which makes the diagnosis very difficult. Um, here are other cases of internal hernia. Again, an abrupt cutoff of the SMV um, and a swirl sign. Um, here's another case. Um, so this patient has an apparent mesenteric defect. You see small bowel loop uh, vessels and fat getting pulled into this defect. Um, and upstream to this, you see this dilated bowel loop. So it looks like the patient has an obstruction. Uh, this was called an internal hernia with upstream obstruction. Uh, the patient was taken to the OR. However, in this case, the surgeon noted that there was no internal hernia, and this was due to an adhesive band. So again, just highlighting how difficult these cases are. <laughs> 
This next patient, um, again, presents with abdominal pain. Um, in this case, we do see this dilated bowel loop, and within this bowel loop, you see another bowel loop, and then you see mesenteric fat and vessels being pulled inside. So this looks like a jejunal jejunal intussusception. This is a rare complication of gastric bypass. It typically occurs at or near the JJ anastomosis. Uh, ideology is thought to be related to mesenteric thinning in the setting of weight loss or disruption of intestinal pacemakers. So uh, to finish off the bariatric cases, uh, look at a sleeve gastrectomy. This patient actually presented with shortness of breath initially. Um, there was, uh, CTPA was performed where we saw this large collection in the left upper quadrant. Uh, this is a subsequent CT with oral contrast. And again, we see this large collection in the left upper quadrant. Um, you do see this hyperdense material within the collection. This is the, the oral contrast just leaking into it. Uh, so this was a leak in the setting of uh, sleeve gastrectomy. Next, we'll move on to some GU cases. Um, so for prostatectomy, there are two approaches, intraperitoneal and extraperitoneal. Uh, the intraperitoneal approach is associated with a larger operating space and improved visibility, although there is a risk of bowel injury. Now, now the extraperitoneal approach has a more difficult access, resulting in longer operative times, although any hematoma or urine leak in this space is extraperitoneal. The same collection in the intraperitoneal cavity would cause uh, uh, bowel ileus and um, prolonged, uh, prolonged ileus. An additional advantage of the extraperitoneal approach is that there's no risk of bowel injury. Here are some of the complications. So uh, here's our prostatectomy patient presenting with hip pain. A CT cystogram was performed, and at the level of the anastomosis, we do see this hyperdense material. This is contrast, which is extraluminal, so this is an anastomotic leak. Um, different patient, uh, he presents to the ER with blood clots in the urine. Uh, they perform the CT after a minute, uh, placing a Foley catheter and noting poor drainage. So uh, immediately when you look in the bladder, you see the clots in the bladder. Uh, and then note the positioning of the Foley catheter, which explains the, uh, the poor drainage. Um, so they reposition the Foley and um, repeat the cystogram. And you will notice that uh, there's contrast outlining bowel loops here. Uh, so then I'm just pointing at this in the supra umbilical region because it suggests that the, uh, the operation was performed with an intraperitoneal approach, which, ex which explains why the contrast was in the peritoneal cavity. This was confirmed on the operative note. All right, next we'll move on to C-section. Um, so complications include infection and bleeding. Uh, with regard to bleeding, uh, hematomas tend to accumulate in one of two places, the subfascial hematoma, um, and the bladder flap hematoma, which is between the lower uterine segment and the bladder. Um, here's our case. Uh, a C section was performed 10, 10 days ago, and we do see this hyperdense heterogeneous collection between the bladder and the lower uterine segment. So, this is a bladder flap hematoma. Um, bladder flap hematomas are usually treated conservatively. However, if they're over four centimeters, uh, there's, uh, there's this, you have to raise suspicion for a um, uterine dehiscence. Uh, similarly, these little defects in the lower uridine segment, we see them with C-section, but uh, again, because we have this large collection, this one measured about nine centimeters, so we have to raise this uh, suspicion for uterine dehiscence. Uh, next, we'll talk about hernia. Uh, here are some of the complications. Uh, again, bleeding infection and bowel obstruction. So here's our first patient. He had a right inguinal hernia repair, uh, and in these images, we see all this hyperdense uh, material all along the, the inguinal canal extending into the scrotum. Uh, so this is a hematoma. This next patient had a ventral hernia repair, and we see a fluid collection in the operative site with a lot of overlying soft tissue thickening and stranding. So this is an abscess. So in this final case, we have these dilated bowel loops. Um, on these sagittal and axial images, we do see a transition point at the level of the umbilical hernia repair site. So this is a small bowel obstruction. All right, so in summary, uh, common surgical complications include bleeding, infection, and organ injury. Uh, knowledge of events around surgery are important, so it's important to look at the operative note to see if there were any intra-op complications noted. Um, also, understanding the post-operative anatomy is essential, particularly in cases of bowel resection and uh, uh, gastric bypass. Thank you.